Five years ago, I moved to Dublin as a newly qualified personal trainer with huge hopes, dreams and ambitions. I've always wanted to be something special. I even rem remember as a kid being sat in these seats in this theatre with my parents and thinking someday I'm going to speak on that stage. And I didn't know what for, but I always wanted to be something. So after getting qualified as a personal trainer, I made the move to Dublin and I saw it as my time to shine. I thought about how they'd be so proud of me back in Galway when I became Ireland's leading fitness guru. And I thought about how proud my family and friends would be of me when I made it in the big smoke. I quickly found out living in Dublin, it wasn't going to be that easy. I had no community or no network there, and I struggled to find my first few personal training clients. Before long, I was working part-time in a clothes shop to try to pay the bills. I didn't tell people that at home because I didn't want them to know I was struggling. And I didn't want to let the dream die. Even with that, I couldn't pay the rent. And I was borrowing money from anyone I could. I wasn't willing to admit defeat. I didn't want to borrow money from anyone. I didn't want to be working in a clothes shop part-time. But more than anything, I didn't want to fail. But eventually, I had to admit defeat. On Christmas Eve, my dad rang me inquiring as to when I'd be home to see my family for Christmas. And I tried to keep it together on the phone and swallowed my pride as I told him that I wasn't doing that well and I didn't have the 12 euro to get the bus fare home. I'll never forget the bus journey home. For three hours, I cried. It's Christmas Eve, the time everyone's excited to go home and see their friends and family, and here I am, the biggest failure, the biggest loser. I put my hood up, I put my head down, I just cry. Usually if you get the bus home from Dublin to your hometown, you meet people you know. There was probably people I knew on that bus, but I just didn't know what was going on outside of what was going on in my head. And I couldn't even buy a small gift for my mum. So I got a card and I wrote, I'll take you out to lunch in the new year when things are better. And it broke my heart. Lucky for me, a friend of mine offered me some part-time work in a pizzeria. People in Galway will know the place. It wasn't the dream for a personal trainer, but it got me out of the house and it got me out of my own head a bit. And when I wasn't working as a waiter, I'd walk up and down the beach for hours every day, just looking for some revelation, some inspiration, some glimmer of hope and some light at the end of this dark tunnel. And more often than not, I'd have tears in my eyes or tears streaming down my face, still feeling like a failure. And if I'd bump into someone I knew, I'd wipe away the tears and make sure they knew that there was nothing wrong. And on one of these walks, I had a bit of a breakthrough. I realized, yes, I failed with my first personal training business, and yes, it's a recession, but there are other people that are doing well, so there must be a way. And I headed home, and with nothing to lose, I jumped on my dad's computer and emailed some trainers in the UK that looked like they were doing really well. I said, I'm a young trainer, I'd appreciate any advice on how I can get this thing started. And to my surprise, one guy got back to me, a guy called Mark Tregilgais over in Cardiff, who was doing really well as a trainer. Mark said later that day he would hop on the phone with me and give me some tips, some advice, and some encouragement. And he did that. And it amazed me that this stranger was reaching out and taking time for me. And that little bit of belief that he instilled in me prompted me to give it another go, to give my dream another go. I advertised a fitness class down on the local beach. And people later told me that was genius, outdoor training. But I had no money for rent, so it was genius. And I remember turning up the first day and I turned up an hour early, and I had no equipment. I cycled down and I put cones on the floor. That's all I had, the little bit of equipment I had. And for an hour before the class, I walked back and forth and visualized 20, 30, maybe 40 people turning up to my class. And come 7 o'clock, as it was due to start, five people turned up, only five. And to anyone else, that might have seemed like a failure, and they might have felt dejected by that, but I was over the moon. I cycled home faster than I'd ever cycled before, excited to tell my mom about my new business and my five clients. You see, I was coming at personal training now from a different perspective. When I lived in Dublin, I was caught in my head. I wanted to be a superstar. And I thought fitness was about push-ups and sit-ups and broccoli and spinach. That's all I saw. And now I'd come home and I'd hit this low point. I realized it could be so much more, and it should be so much more. I think we've all got three places, our home life, our work life, and then our third place. So for some people, the third place is a yoga class or a meditation. For other people, it's... I don't know, the pub for some people. Everyone's got somewhere they go to escape because the home life is not always happy and the work life is not always fulfilling. We've got stuff going on, we want somewhere to escape. And I knew the third place for the five people on the beach with me was 
the beach with me. That was their third place, their place to get away. I didn't know what was going on in other areas of their life, but I knew it could be a great part of their day, and I set out to try to be the best part of these people's day. The same way Mark had instilled a little bit of belief in me with that phone call when I needed it, I said, I'm going to pass that forward to these five people. And I came back the second month to the beach, and I've got 20 people on the beach. And they start instilling this belief in each other. It's not just me passing it over. Everyone's starting. It's reciprocal. And then I come back the third month, there's 100 people on the beach. When I came back from Dublin and said I was going to do a boot camp on the beach, people told me, you're not in California now, Pat. You're in the west of Ireland. No one's going to train on the beach. And with 100 people, things are going so well, I get a visit from the guards in the middle of a session. <laughs> and they tell me, Pat, what time is this over? We're coming back for you. Don't go anywhere. You can imagine my clients are wondering what I was doing at the weekend or what was going on. And the, clients pull, or the guards pull up at the end of the session, put down the window. They say, Pat, like, lock your bike, grab your things. You're going to have to come with us. And my heart sinks. I turn around to pick up my things, and as I do, they start laughing hysterically. They say, we have a big guy in the back that needs to get in shape. Will you look after him? <laughs> so I've gone from this guy with no belief to five clients, to 20 clients, to 100 clients. Now I've got the guards on my side, feeling indestructible. There was a man that used to walk his dog up and down that beach every day and always look over, and he was too stubborn to come and ask, I think. But eventually, curiosity got the better of him. A hundred people on the beach, what's this all about? And he came and asked. He said, what, what is this? I said, oh, it's a fitness class. We train three times a week. We give nutritional support. We give online support. And we make people strong. We make people feel good. It's 75 euro a month. And his jaw hit the floor. And he said, you mean to tell me you expect me to pay 75 euro to train in the cold, in the rain, on the beach, when I could pay the same thing and get a hot shower and a pool and a sauna and a jacuzzi in his local gym. Because while he didn't understand that it wasn't about the push-ups and the sit-ups and the squats, from a distance you saw a group of people doing these exercises and running between cones, but really what it was about was the words that were being said and the belief that was being instilled. I knew that the people that were coming to train needed a little bit of encouragement and acknowledgement, and they needed compliments, and they needed just little things. Again, maybe, I, maybe there was other stuff going on in their other lives that I didn't know about. Maybe they were the same as me, walking the beach, lost, isolated, lonely and depressed, wiping back tears when I met people so no one would know there was something wrong. So I made a, a conscious effort. I'm gonna, every time they come and train with me, I'm going to make them feel good. And it became, like I say, this just, just this culture of belief. Everyone started thinking they could do anything. We've got hundreds of people now on the beach. And people start achieving amazing things in fitness, which is to be expected with a fitness class. But more than that, we started seeing people leaving abusive relationships and starting new relationships and starting new careers and starting new businesses. And the confidence was just amazing. And uh, with the fitness improvement, some people decided to set a big goal. Well, I set the goal for them and pushed, them, pushed it out to them. I told them, 22-kilometer obstacle course, I'd like you to try it. There's some barbed wire, there's some ice bats, there's some climbing walls, there's some climbing ropes and some other obstacles along the way, but you'd be fine. I get a handful of clients that jump on this, say they want to do it. But I stand back and an amazing thing starts happening. The little nudge that Mark gave me on the phone four years ago prompted me to start with five people. And now I watch my clients start to nudge each other and suddenly it's, well, if I'm okay to do this, you'll be okay too and it just starts to grow. We've got 100 people for this mud run, we've got 200 people for this mud run, we've 300 people. A small gym in the west of Ireland ended up bringing 540 people to an adventure race, the biggest, adve the biggest team ever worldwide for an adventure race, and raised 165,000 euro for cystic fibrosis in the process. Um, I, prom I told you about promising my mum lunch um, in the new year when things were better. I finally got to bring her for the lunch, and it was the best of Galway Awards, and they acknowledged me as the best gym. But I never had a gym. I didn't have saunas and steam rooms and hot showers. I didn't have marketing budgets and teams. I had nothing, only a beach, and a whole lot of people that felt like they belonged to something, and they felt a sense of belief in themselves. And that's what it's all about. Four years ago, I was at my lowest point, Lost, isolated, lonely, depressed, emotionally broken, walking the beach, not seeing any hope, desperate. And a stranger made a phone call to me. And that, that gave me the belief to try something one more time, to give my dream one more chance. And I went to the beach, and I tried to give that to five more people. 
And that one conversation resulted in hundreds of clients in Galway. And that one conversation resulted in thousands of clients online. And that one conversation resulted in a quarter of a million for charity. And that one conversation resulted in 200,000 people a day now seeing my updates about hope and belief and belonging and all these things every day. That's the power that one conversation can have and one interaction can have. Because we never know what's going on in other people's lives. People mask things when they're feeling lost or they're feeling alone or whatever they're feeling. And I know that one conversation can change things. One smile, one compliment, one acknowledgement, something small to change someone's day can change someone's life. So four years ago, Mark gave me a little nudge that sparked this domino effect that I'm hoping I can give everyone here a little nudge today to further the domino effect that we can change people's lives. I thought going to Dublin that you had to be a superstar and you had to be a celebrity and you had to be all these things, a millionaire, then you could affect change. I talked about my mum and bringing her to that um, awards and hitting my lowest point, not being able to buy her a present. I'll just share something my dad told me again when I was at my lowest point. Dad told me that regardless of your current position in life, you're in a position to help other people, so don't wait. And that's my prompt today. Don't think you're not good enough to affect change. Don't think that you can't change people's lives. One smile, one acknowledgement, one compliment, taking an interest, that's how we change lives. I've learned a lot of things in four years, but the biggest thing that I've learned is that the world is a mirror. And when you go out there and you smile at people, and you take an interest in people, and you converse with people, and you believe in people, even when you don't believe in yourself, your whole world changes. So like I said, or like my dad said, regardless of your current position in life, you're in a position to help other people. So don't wait. Thank you.